The main functions of science can be termed as primarily comprehension and control. The comprehension is sometimes merely that of the physical, but more often it deals with the universal forces that affect the lives of each one of us. We know that the vast spaces surrounding our planet are teeming with micrometeors and radiations that originate from the stars and the distant galaxies. Strange and little understood phenomena have been observed in the depths of our oceans and deep within the mass that underlies the crust of this globe upon which we live. With the help of instruments and the accepted natural mathematical laws, we have been able to expand our comprehension, but to a small degree. Man has learned that life is everywhere, and although we are part of it, it seems the thing we understand the least. The great mysteries we seek to unlock could be no more manifest than within our own being. Actually, our quest for comprehension is perhaps most complicated by the failure to discover reality within ourselves. If we are unable to see the woods because of the trees, if we fail first truly to comprehend, then it follows that there can be no chance of any type of control. <laughs> out into space, preparing to invade the incomprehensible universe which has held its many secrets since the beginning. The beginning? We're not at all sure that that term or any other can actually relate to a transition such as gases solidifying to form a planet which would eventually support living inhabitants. What we view as the beginning or the end of something is clouded by the limitations of the mind machine itself. Now, if that mind machine had the power to conceive properly of the additional dimension of time, our measurements of it would cease. Man would see the Earth, the stars, the whole cosmic void as timeless, limitless. When deeper comprehension is brought about, by evolutionary processes. Man's limitations in space will thus vanish. He will easily be able to travel from one planet to another, from one galaxy to another. The stream of knowledge evolution produces will become a powerful force, one easily able to conquer time itself and the immeasurable distances of space.
Diane Wilson. Average American girl living in a suburban community. She had never been known to be mentally ill or behave in the erratic manner in which the police patrol had found her. Chief of Police Arnold Johnson had been accustomed to dealing with the many and varied situations that often called for extensive professional assistance. In this case, he called upon the best qualified man he knew. Dr. Ian Sabiri. M.D. and specialist in psychiatry. The doctor had known Miss Wilson throughout most of her years and was very much disturbed upon hearing of her present condition. It was agreed he would leave at once for an attempt to determine the cause of her unorthodox and very sudden seizure. <laughs> Girls waiting outside. Oh, have her come in. And see if Dr. Sabiri is finished with his report. Yes, sir. Oh. Won't you sit down, Mrs. Wilson? Dr. Sabiri has asked several of us to help him with your daughter. I'd like to ask you a few questions about her, if that's all right. Well, of course, Doctor, anything. Have you been upstairs to the room? I've been with her all morning. I just can't believe it. I'll never forgive myself. For what, Mrs. Wilson? For letting this terrible thing happen to her. In what way do you feel responsible? We had a quarrel. She left the house and went to stay at a friend's place across town. It was one of those needless things, and I'm afraid mostly my fault. Uh, what was the uh, nature of the quarrel? Mrs. Wilson, I hope you understand the seriousness of Diane's condition. She's fallen victim to one of the most unusual seizures we've ever run into. And if we're to help her, it's essential that we understand everything that happened last night. I'm sorry. The quarrel wasn't over something you'd call new. I'm ashamed to say we've been going on with it for over six months. Mm -hmm. Diane has had the idea of going to Switzerland to stay with her uncle while she prepares for the Olympic Games. She won a silver medal in figure skating two years ago, and she's insisted ever since on living in Switzerland. Well, naturally, I want her to stay here. We have from time to time what we call cases of self-imposed withdrawal from personal communication due to hysteria or emotional disappointments of one kind or another, or by one suffering from a paranoid structure. However, considering everything I've learned about your daughter, I'm inclined to dismiss all such possibilities. Everything points to just one thing. A situation of sudden violence. Oh, good morning. Good morning. morning. You know Mrs. Wilson. Yes, very well. How are you, Mrs. Wilson? I can't really tell, Doctor. <sighs> Have you seen Diane? I just left her. Well, is there any change? Is she able to talk yet? I'm afraid not. She's just lying still the same as before. If you're finished, I'd like to go back upstairs. Of course, Mrs. Wilson. I want to thank you for your patience and understanding. Well, I'm glad to do anything to help. Oh, uh, just one thing. Had Diane noticeably suffered fear of anything in particular? Fear? No, not that I know of. I see. Thank you. Well, thank you. an ominous ring about this whole situation. I couldn't agree more. What about the flying saucer story? Did it check out? I can't believe that that could be connected in any way with this case. I'm not entirely convinced that it isn't. Come on, Jim. We're not living in the 16th century. Mm. <laughs> no doubt that that generation made the same observation about the 14th century. Do you recall 
a series of incidents about a year ago involving three different women during a, a flying saucer sighting? I, I think so. According to these files, the symptoms were identical to what we have right now. But those cases were attributed to a physical cause. <laughs> attributed, but not proven. Dr. Jensen was handling the case with the help of at least three internal specialists. I remember Jensen telling me quite specifically of the questions in everyone's mind, including his own. Hmm. One of the women disappeared and the other two had to be committed. In all three cases, there was no record of a previous illness, and each one was stricken on a lonely street late at night. That's exactly my point. The one girl raved incessantly about a sound. A piercing, high-frequency vibration seemed to emanate from above with a tremendous and steady intensity. I'll get hold of Jensen. Gentlemen, the external ear, as you're both aware, is an instrument capable of receiving vibrations of a given frequency, even though there may be some small difference between one individual and the other. As the sound is transmitted into the inner ear, and assuming there has never been any damage through accident or infection, the sensitivity of reception is greatly increased. Now, with this amplification, the sound is transmitted into the brain. We were able to establish with one of the women involved a certain amount of tissue inflammation which led us to believe that she not only did hear the sound she claimed to hear, but that they must have brought on an immense pressure to the brain. Dr. Jensen, we've checked with at least a dozen people living in the neighborhood where Diane was staying, and not one person heard anything at all. Now, was this factor investigated in your other cases? Did you find any evidence that these so-called transmissions were real, such as their being picked up by instruments? No, we were unable to find any evidence of the sound other than the physical evidence I just told you of. Why, a, a tissue inflammation such as you've described could be caused by any number of things. I can't accept that as evidence of anything. What if Dr. Jensen were to recognize the same condition in Miss Wilson? You, you mean surgery? No, no, the mother would never go for that. You gentlemen appear to be involved in the same procrastination process I found myself in over a year ago. There were six of us working together, and I can tell you it was no easy matter to come to our final conclusion. I understood you were left up in the air about the whole thing. Uh, that was the situation before we performed the surgery, but afterwards our thinking became much more closely knit. All of you felt certain that the object in the sky was in itself responsible. Well, perhaps certain is a word we all try to avoid. But we became pretty well convinced of the fact. Tell me this. Has the girl told you anything at all about her experience? Oh, by the time we examined her, she was incapable of speech. Mm. But the police officers who brought her to the hospital told us that, that they distinctly heard her mention over and again about the sounds she was hearing. And the officers heard nothing at all. Have you had the opportunity to probe the possibilities of directional transmission? With the proper tuning instruments, a great deal could be done in the projection of vibrations and controlling the transmission, much the same as in reception. <laughs> well, this is the premise I've been pondering since last night. The narrow beam were projected on a frequency exactly that of uh, the highest capacity of a given individual. No doubt others would be totally unaware of the existing vibrations. Well, everything under discussion seems to bring us back repeatedly to the same thing. Well, it's by far the most logical explanation. You have to admit that the sighting was genuine. And at the same time, the time element was exactly right. <laughs> if there were creatures around us who were clever enough to fly through space, they most certainly would be capable of devising the transmission mechanism we're talking about. All right. Let's say, for the sake of argument, you do establish this theory as a cause. Mm. Granted, there was a purpose in the singling out of Diane Wilson last night, and there, there was, in fact, a transmission directed at her. 
Can you tell me precisely just how we can help the girl? I have some ideas about that. Would you care to join us, Doctor? Why, yes. Yes, of course. to the north, another skier was rapidly covering the distance between the frozen wasteland and the nearest spot of civilization. Only this excursion was not for pleasure. A mission of desperate urgency was the driving force. The native Laplanders had witnessed something evil in the sky. the desolate communications shack, the messenger hurried to reach the telegraph operator and tell him of what had been seen in the north. A story that was relayed to the city and ultimately the entire world. Dr. Frederick Wilson, Diane's uncle and world-famous geologist, was summoned from his laboratory to report immediately to a quickly formed group of outstanding personnel presently available to expedite requests by the Air Force Command of the local area. The second man called was Dr. Eric Engstrom, also a geologist, and noted throughout Europe as an outstanding leader in past work of dangerous glacier penetration. The plan was to investigate the area of the Lap village under controlled conditions 24 hours a day by a team composed of both scientific and military personnel. Doctors Engstrom and Wilson had not previously had occasion to work together, but had for years mutually respected the contributions provided by both. Three would be expected to locate fragments of the meteor, which due to reports of heavy avalanche, was assumed to have fallen in the vicinity of the Lat village of Canoli. A plane was scheduled to take them immediately to Landspar, which would represent their point of embarkation.
Lucky for us you were in Switzerland, Doctor. Well, I think I'm the lucky one, Eric. You know, I've been chasing these things for 30 years. But the thrill of analyzing a fragment from another planet gets more interesting each time. I've been watching those boats down there. What are they? Four boats from the Kiranella mine. Do you think that the magnetic attraction of the mines could, could have any bearing on the meteor falling there? Come on, Doctor. Who said it had to be a meteor? <laughs> the group from the Royal Academy, right? <laughs> Colonel Bodiger has been assigned to your party. He and the others are interrogating some labs. How soon can we see the Colonel? He asked me to take you directly to the flight office. I have a staff car standing by, sir. Thank you. Never has this village lost a large head of reindeer. He says the Renault is chased by the devil. It shows something of great size caused the avalanche. Well, at this time of year, every snowpack in the air is probably cracked. The slightest vibration can start an avalanche. They know that, but they are convinced this one has some connection with the meteor. Ask him if he actually witnessed the meteor. So we back again, Mr. He says it passed right over his village. All our forces. He says the object came with a great roar, a fireball as large as a mountain. Or well, how accurate would you say his estimate of size is? He's one of their elders. I'm sure he's trustworthy. Colonel, the plane is ready on the lake with all the photographic equipment on board, sir. We can take off any time. Very good, Sergeant. I thought we would attempt to locate the site before landing at Rixia. Yeah, we? we leave as soon as you change your clothes. Fine. If we can get some good pictures, it'll eliminate a lot of guesswork. Leave your bags in the lobby and come back here as soon as the pictures are developed. Fine. I hope you and the sergeant can join us for dinner. We'll be glad to.
I think our young geologist has made a discovery. Well, wait till he finds out his discovery is my niece, Diane. Now, there's championship form, with or without skates. Scientific observation, no doubt. Hello, darling. She knows me. That's all. Isn't that funny? Usually, I never forget a pretty face. Or a pair of pretty legs. <laughs> Scientific observation, no doubt. Mm. I better hurry, Doc, see if I want to get some skiing before dinner. Right. <laughs> Uncle Frank, gee, I'm glad to see you. Surprised, honey? As a matter of fact, no. After what's been happening up here, I've been half expecting you. Oh. Glad to. He? Uncle Frank. Oh, he? Well, his name is Eric. Jerry Kenshaw. What was he doing with you? Why didn't you introduce me? Oh, wait a minute. Now, hold it. One, he's a geologist in my party. Two, I didn't want to see my favorite niece get hurt. Oh, dangerous, huh? Not dangerous. Deadly. You can believe your old uncle, that lad, has left a string of broken hearts all over Europe. Well, maybe an American could even see. Coming back? He said something about going skiing. See you. Hey! Remember, I warned you. That better be an apology, Mr. Eric Ingstrom. You do know me, don't you? Huh, know you? Your reputation's the talk of the United States. It is? Sir, they're even thinking of passing a law against you. <laughs> Tell me, are all American girls as crazy as you? Worse. Some of us even like wolves. Perhaps you give this wolf the pleasure walking back with him. That could long as it's key. Exactly. Well, if you insist. Certainly, sir. Could you please hurry? We're all waiting dinner for you. She is crazy. Sir? That girl. Who is she? Why, that's Diane Wilson, the Olympic star. Huh? Her uncle, Dr. Wilson, is in your party. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Too bad you're so tired, Eric. Diane's missing out on a lot of lovely music. Let's see. Ask her for that. Just watch yourself. Oh, no. It's an honor. <laughs> Come, my friend. Say again, son. What's it called, Eric? From Midnight Sun. 
It's based on an old Swedish melody. About love? Because I love you all. I am the Lord. No one is there. No one to share. The midnight My arms wait in case for you come to me. The night will not be long, for we will be as one while sharing love, the beauty of the midnight sun. Tell you on the way. Good, I'll get my coat. Well, I'm very glad you did, Captain. How far away are we? Less than an hour's ride. Is anyone going to talk to me? No. At least we promise not to make you walk home. Ja, det var bra att ni kom så fort. Var är det någonstans? Följ spåret till höger. Bra. This way, sir. Right. Oh, no, young lady. You stay right here. sure it's any animal that we've ever seen. Look at this bone. Not broken, it's splintered. You're right.
That's the lab bill that reported the avalanche. The meteor should be in one of those deep valleys. Let's go down and take a closer look. that size should have stopped where it hit. Magnetic attraction certainly couldn't cause that. Is that it, Murray? Doing any good back there? Yes, sir. Taking a whole roll on this run, sir. After this pass, we'll head back to Rick's job. Come here early in the morning. Well, there seems to be nothing here that we didn't see with our naked eye. The area looked exactly the same as it did when we flew over it this afternoon. Not a footprint in sight. Well, why should whatever it is they put in the crater? She's right. There's no real reason to believe in a connection between this reindeer business and what's probably a perfectly ordinary meteor. No, I have my doubts about that. Reports of the meteor traveling horizontally. Skid marks, small size of the crater. All this seems to indicate not so much a normal impact as some kind of a landing. Don't you think we're letting our imaginations run a little while? We won't really know anything until we get there, will we? We? Aren't I invited? Oh, no, not this trip. You just stay here and look pretty till we come back. Colonel, how soon can we take off? I'd like to get underway as soon as it's light. Let's plan on leaving the airstrip no later than uh, 6 o'clock. Go get my camera recorder. most of the morning. Keep in touch with airbase weather. Yes, sir. This is one place we don't want to be stranded. All right, let's go. All right, Professor. Now, 
Now, where do you think you're going? Please, I'm sorry. But now that I'm here, you know I'm an expert skier. I can handle myself as well as any of you. Well, she's your niece, Doctor. Well, it's your expedition. It was my expedition. Go down and take a closer look. We'll just make a preliminary investigation, have it? You mind staying here with Diane? No. She doesn't have to babysit. We'll be right back. Are you ready, Doctor? Let's go. what this has to be. Colonel, no human technology has produced anything like this. The outer layer must be a shell of some heat-resistant material. Don't touch it. Come on, let's get out of here. before dark. Yeah, but how about you? No, no, you two could have helped back here before we got halfway. All right. If we're out back by morning, though, you better start following our trail. Come on, Diane. Calling SR-332. Aircraft SR-332. Please come in if you read us. Over. Try it again. SR-332, aircraft SR-332, please come in if you read us. Over. How long has it been? Too long, I'm afraid. We haven't heard a thing since Canola. The captain said that Dr. Wilson would call us by radio himself when they reached the site of the meteor. Is it possible they landed the plane? 
And with the antenna close to the ground, the signals won't carry. Not very likely. You see, that terrain is from three to 5,000 feet at the lowest point. Now, their antenna has sufficient altitude to carry from three to 400 miles, perhaps even farther. Mm, the only thing I can think of is that they may have landed the plane, perhaps several miles away from the site because of the snow conditions, and they had to carry on by foot. Now, now that would account for a considerable delay in their being in a position to contact us. Is that the only thing you can think of? Well, let's, let's not say it's the only thing I can think of. Let's just say that uh, it's the only explanation I want to consider right now. Time comes to paint a darker picture. You can put your bottom down or I'll, I'll think of something. But uh, right now it's too early to push the panic button. All right. Come on, keep trying. Calling SR-332, aircraft SR-332. Please come in. We're standing by waiting for your message. Over. <laughs> Come in, Kanolik. We're standing by. Over. Hello, Ashfire. I'm afraid I haven't been able to pick up anything from Dr. Wilson. I've been monitoring your call ever since you started, and it looks to me like either a crash landing or a possible freak weather condition. I've been picking up a strange kind of static intermittently all day. I've never heard anything like it before. Over. Hello, Kanolik. Uh, can you tell us your precise weather condition right now? Over. It looks as if we may be in for a storm. But this static I've been hearing doesn't sound in any way like the usual storm interference. Over. Uh, keep listening and uh, give us a shout if there's any change. Uh, this is uh, Lance for out. Do you know offhand how many planes would be available that can fly at low altitude? I imagine there's um, five or six. But what about that storm? Now, I'm hoping it doesn't materialize. If it does, we'll just have to wait it out. Here you go, fellas. Oh, boy, thank you. Anything come in? Uh, well, only a report from Canola like they're expecting a storm. A big one? He didn't say. I mean, all the more I think about it, the more I'm concerned about that static. And he said it wasn't due to the storm in any way or any way familiar. Maybe it's some kind of a message from Dr. Wilson. Sounds feasible. If his radio was out, he would probably try to set up some makeshift static transformer. What do you think? It's worth following through. Yeah. Get back to Canole. Tell him to make a tape of what he's picking up up there. Then feed it into his transmitter so that we can read it here. Right. I'll go back to the tracer and bring our equipment. Right.
The Lats, being forced to migrate south out of fear of avalanches that had been reported still commencing at points near and around them, were taken to groups covering various routes to the village of Kanorlik. Fortunately for Dr. Wilson and the remaining airmen, these nomads would provide a welcome escort. W.J. Canolic 97 calling Landspar W.J. Come in, Landspar. Canolic 97, this is Landspar reading you. Landspar W.J. Canolic 97, your plane arrived okay. It's on the landing field now. Over. Hello, Canolic. This is Commander Treatment speaking. I have something for Dr. Wilson. Is he there with you at present? Over. Landspar W.J., uh, Dr. Wilson is outside right now, but... Kenolik? Hello, Kenolik. Why don't you get your transmission? Is anything wrong? I don't know. Hello, Kenolik. Kenolik 9-7. Come in, please. You can Should be a ladder. Yeah, here it is. Ah, uh, let me help. Oh, I have to take these off. You start a fire. Okay. You might as well get out of those wet things while you're at it. Is it what? Oh, it's a blanket on the box. I want to get some hot concrete on that spring of yours. Why leave? Ten years off the seas, and I have to take a time like this to rent my knees. What shall I do? Don't worry. I'll keep my back. If I make it to the last village by dawn. They should have Iran at Rick's Jarvis before noon. What about Uncle Vance? Well, I'll send a search party back to the crater. They'll find them. I hope they're all right. Eric? Yeah? If that object is like one of our satellites, then couldn't the creature be one of their animals? Don't worry about the creature. What you mean now is some hot concrete is under that knee. I'll melt some snow.
Now, let me see that knee. Uh, Hurt much? No, not too bad. Huh? This will do it good. Feel better? back first thing in the morning. found a trail leading away from the cabin, but lost it when the wind started. Is it still out there? Harry, the laps you're looking for. They'll find it. How did you get here? The party of laps arrived about an hour after you and Diane left. Where Henry and Bobby? Well, Buddy this plane should be landing in a few minutes. And Henrik? Henrik? Henrik bed with an accident. He went back to the crater of the equipment and he found his body at the bottom of the trench. Crater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Diane saw him at the camp. 
y costeado.
nappi toppe vaadeen nuu vel hovasti solmu ja tahe nuu stuodat ja molan kannu pallaan tenna. They have seen the creature. It invaded their campsite. What about Diane? Have they seen her? Hän on sertifikkaan. Joo, moinen takuus teitä punnani eittä tätä vasta sai. The creature was carrying something in his arm. Could have been a woman. Uh-huh. Think to confine it to the spot where they were camped? I died. Good. <laughs> organized lap party to help us follow him. I sent a ski runner down to Rick's garage. Well, I'm not going to wait. If Diane's still alive, I want to reach her before he does.
into their village. How can I? Look at them. But it's got Diane. Paddle, see what you can do. Hip play! I wonder if they found out what they wanted to know. Well, let's hope for better luck when we set foot on some other world. Time involved in the journey from our world back to theirs could only be known by them. If we search deeply enough into this, perhaps we find an omen. Memories are diminished as the passing of time provides a past. It equally brings to us the future. And without a future, there would be no present. 